For the National Housing Authority, it was a year of frustration, particularly in the area of collection of arrears. And from the last report we had our board meeting, we had something like $45 million out in arrears and mortgages. If I were a private owner, I would put those places up for sale already. But remember that this is a national housing. If I put these people up for sale, the amount of noise that I am going to get, the amount of papers and polit politicians and everybody, what they are saying, if I feel that all the politicians would look at this as a national issue and would support the national housing, I go tomorrow and put up everybody for sale. But this is where we are put in a position. You put up the people for sale, they run to politicians, and then they begin to say, oh, you are inhumane, you're putting the people on the road. This is what we are up against. Government in 1985 was able to provide only a fraction of the housing needs of the country. Joining in the housing thrust was a private organization, Susu Lands, aimed at the low-income family, and a number of other agencies, including private developers. But in most cases, homes were outside of the reach of those who needed them most, and squatting continued to be part of the social system. In the new year, the government hopes to deal with that problem by regularizing the position of certain squatters who meet established criteria. Electricity supplies were improved in the country in 1985. t and installed new generating and transmission equipment, and the Commission can now reach consumers in 97% of the country. It has excess generating capacity to satisfy the demand of its 270,000 users. Perhaps the best news from the Commission in 1985 was that at the third quarter it was showing a profit in its operations. But the Commission told us that by the end of the year it would have reached a break-even point. WASA, on the other hand, was still operating at a deficit. Its application for a rate increase to offset this was heard by the Public Utilities Commission, but a ruling on the matter is reserved. While WASA waits for a PUC verdict, the Port Authority has been enjoying the benefits of a rate adjustment handed down in August. The Tribunal has, however, determined that the order would be effective for one year beginning October 15, 1985, after which a review of the rate structure will be undertaken. The Port Authority should by then have completed negotiations with the SWWTU for a new agreement which incorporates a shift system. Other reforms which the Authority has pledged to introduce should also be in place by then. The Authority would likewise have had an opportunity to monitor the volume of cargo moving over its walls, as well as assess the impact of the new rates on its revenue. The Public Transport Service Corporation, described by its chairman as an awakening giant, made rapid strides towards the goal of an efficient public transportation system in 1985. A major physical development program was completed during the year, and the corporation is now in a better position to service and maintain its fleet of buses. Its Super Express service and the exclusive use of the priority bus route enhanced its image, and the bus company was able in 1985 to provide competition to taxis. And it's the first time in Trinidad and Tobago that we are hearing people are complaining about the buses is giving the taxis and the maxi-taxi problems. You know, we used to hear other complaints. By the end of October, the PTSE had moved over 35 million passengers, a dramatic improvement over the total figure of 84 when it moved 31 million people. But operating expenditure and the fact that fares are controlled create financial problems for the corporation. PTSC officials are eager to have the corporation become financially viable, but they do not see this with the present fare structure. And in addition, the corporation provides free transportation to pensioners and all school children ride free. Education and the future of the national education system was addressed during 1985. A public consultation on a draft education plan was held at Chagaramas to sound out public opinion on this very important issue. No one, I think, will disagree with the statement that the most important single factor in the success of a good school is the quality of its leadership. Principals in Trinidad and Tobago should be given back some of the authorities which they once had. Principals got no authority in this country, and that is why discipline has broken down, and that is why teacher performance is so poor.
so on so we say lowest ebb in the country principals cannot mr chairman it hurts my heart to see picketing going on and small five-year-old children being given a picket to hold if parents want to picket let them do it that is their right but do not drag those little children into the picketing for one day those very children who feel that by picketing they will get what they want freely will stand up in front of their parents draw up a picket and hold it up to them far too many teachers have all the required academic qualifications and knowledge but simply cannot teach they do not fully understand the purpose <laughs> they do not fully understand the purpose of their teaching they also do not understand the students and the conditions under which the students live so by year's end an education plan covering the five-year period up to 1990 had been approved by the cabinet and lead in parliament among its recommendations to make education more relevant to the changing demands of the nation. In 1985, firefighters were kept busy. Figures for the period up to June indicated that firemen in the nation responded to 2,600 calls, an average of 14 every day. Many of the blazes were accidental and a large number of them linked to electrical faults. The toll in the nation was high. Latest data show fire losses for the first half of the year totaling nearly $83 million, more than the entire loss for 1984 which stood at $67 million. But there were large fires after June, and when the final tally is done, 1985 may very well go down as the most disastrous year in terms of fire losses since 1970. The 51 state enterprises collectively showed a net loss during 1985, once more leaning on the state for financial support. The energy and natural resources sector showed a drop from last year's position where they recorded a net profit. In 1985, there was a net loss of more than $150 million. Agriculture and agro-based industries, too, showed a net loss in 1985, almost $80 million greater than 1984. Once again, the major reason for this was the continuing poor financial state of Carney Limited, which ended the year with a deficit of $365 million, a loss of a million dollars a day. But there was some positive financial improvement in the third category of state enterprises. Although a net loss was still recorded, the figures showed an improvement in the financial performance of those enterprises falling under the category of finance, transportation, and communication. And state enterprises sources said a major contributor to this improved situation was the effective financial management of the telephone company, which showed an operating profit of more than $21 million for the period January to October 1985. But overall, the bottom line for the state enterprises was in red, from just over $300 million last year to nearly $570 million in 1985. In 1985, state enterprises collectively employed more than 31,000 people who earned wages and salaries in excess of a billion dollars. These people, through direct PAYE taxation, returned an estimated $300 million to the state treasury. Yet in 1985, the state enterprises came in for a severe licking because many of them operating outside of the daily public glare continued to operate without proper public accountability, a, a fact which is more significant since the state enterprises constitute what may be termed the nation's biggest conglomerate, representing an investment of nearly $9 billion of taxpayers' money. The question of accountability came into sharp focus in 1985 when the Public Accounts Enterprises Committee of Parliament tried to summon documents and call witnesses in an investigation into the operations of Plipdeco, the Point Lisa's industrial port development company. 
Plipnikol refused to cooperate and took legal action against the committee to block the investigation. There will be nothing hindering or stopping us from pursuing our activities on behalf of the Parliament and of the people of Trinidad and Tobago until either the court or the Parliament tells us that we are not to proceed along the lines that we are going. By year's end, a dramatic turn in the role of the committee. Its chairman, Senator Lincoln Myers, started a 40-day fast to protest the inaction by the Parliament to make the committee effective. And committee member, Independent Senator Gerald Furness smith resigned in frustration. In particular, we sent for the minute books of the board of directors of that company. We wanted to look at it and see what resolutions had been passed relevant to the accounts that we were examining. Well, they didn't agree with that, and they put a writ on us. They not only said that we did not have power to send for papers or, or people. We also were not properly constituted. Well, here we've been sitting for three years as a parliamentary committee, joint parliamentary select committee, and these people come and tell us that we don't have any power to sit at all. The Attorney General, Senator Russell Martino, did not feel that other senators shared the view of Senator Furness Smith, and on the matter of getting a resolution in the Parliament to deal with the problem, he said it was for the chairman of the committee to get both houses to pass such a resolution, and he dismissed the idea that it was the role of the government to do it. It would not be proper, I think, because you have to remember that, first of all, the chairman of the committee is a member of the opposition. And it may be a bit impertinent mm. for the government to be acting in the name of the chairman or purporting to do something that the chairman should really be doing. And Maze, where Maze is very clear, he says the chairman on motion by the chairman. Secondly, I think that um, in this particular situation, if you are sending for documents and so on, the government will not know because the government is not, I am not on the committee, for example. The chairman of the committee is the person who will know what documents they want, what persons they want. And the resolution, because you have to remember, if the resolution is if, if the resolution is passed and the summons goes out to these people to come and bring documents and they disobey, you know, you can have, it's a condemned parliament and so on, serious consequences flowing. So the resolution must be fairly specific in saying what it wants and giving the powers and i can't know what the commission what the committee wants senator mars is chairman and the committee members would know what they want and this is why it makes good sense for them to ask for the resolution and as i say i think it will be really impertinent for the government to do it why the reluctance for them to take the steps i don't know